Ambati. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Uh, shall I take about 40 minutes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I add a bit to you? Yes, sir. Can yes, I sir. add a bit to you? Okay, okay. Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. I was just. Shall I take about 40, 45 minutes of time? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Puspa uh, Savadatti. The head and then also dean, head of uh, Department of Economic Studies and Planning, Central University of uh, Karnataka, and uh, Dr. Ganapati, who is uh, the moderator for uh, today's uh, session, and Dr. Lingarazu and uh, uh, Dr. Basuras, uh, uh, secretaries. Basuras, yeah. And uh, can we audible, audible to you? Are you able to hear yes, me? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, good. Sir. good. And uh, today's uh, topic is uh, I have slightly changed the title COVID 19 Lockdown and Social Security. Just now I have put on um, uh, the PPT. Yes, I don't know if you can see it. Are you able to see the PPT? Yes, Professor. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. So I was just telling that uh, I have slightly changed the title and okay. I have introduced lockdown because social security was uh, mainly related to lockdown period and then uh, even afterwards also. But then uh, the importance of social security is very, very critical during the lockdown period. And I will explain about this in a short while. The uh, first COVID case in India was reported on January 30th, 2020. And some of you may remember that the first case was reported in Kerala. And uh, for about 45 days, the government of India and also several state governments did not really do much in terms of addressing the problem. Only by middle of uh, March, some efforts were uh, beginning to be made to slow down the spread of virus. A major decision, policy decision was taken on March 25th, 2020. On this day, the total lockdown for 21 days was announced. This lockdown affected everyone. It affected uh, uh, employees of public sector uh, and employees of private sector. It affected uh, farmers. It affected agricultural laborers. It also affected students and it affected practically everyone. But the most affected are the poor and vulnerable, such as unorganized workers who constitute a majority of the workforce in India. So therefore, it is essential to understand social security measures during the lockdown period. I am glad that the Central University of Karnataka has thought that this is an important topic. And then I'm, uh, I'll be very happy to share some of our uh, findings which are based on a survey that we have conducted during the lockdown period or just when uh, lockdown period was uh, uh, ending. So this was, uh, I'll be sharing the results of this uh, study. And I will also be uh, discussing a little bit about uh, uh, the social security and its meaning types and so on and so forth. My presentation is divided into four parts. In the first part, I will discuss about distress that different sections of the people faced during and after the lockdown. This is the first part. In the second part, I will discuss about the concept of social security types, types of social security. Because the reason why I'm, uh, one is discussing about the concept and types, it is this uh, particular aspect is very much related to the access to social security during the COVID-19 lockdown period. 
and uh, you will uh, uh, you will be uh, listening about that in a short while and in the third section i will discuss about access to social security during the lockdown period based on primary data that we have collected from representative districts in karnataka and uh, we will be uh, share i will be sharing the results of uh, this study pertaining to the access to social security in the final section conclusions and recommendations will be provided because the title of this uh, webinar series is covid and indian economy challenges and way forward so therefore after discussing the challenges and i will also be presenting some ways forward now let me get into the first section that is the distress during the lockdown period the lockdown in india is uh, widely known as the largest in the world it is the largest in the world for the simple reason that it affected all the 1.3 billion people in the country and uh, the total economic loss that is estimated to be 26 billion us dollars it is really very significant uh, loss that a country like india has uh, suffered why exactly the the distress the distress was mainly because the government locked down transport services interstate and inter district and transport within a city everything has uh, come to stand still the government closed closed all the public and private offices excepting some emergency uh, services like hospitals police and then uh, fire services and so on and so forth and factories were closed and the mobility was also restricted during this uh, lockdown period of about something like 40 days or something like that 27 million people have lost jobs in uh, april uh, month and most of the people who lost jobs they are all workers deriving livelihood from informal sector activities such as msmes msmes include um, uh, business establishment and then um, the manufacturing uh, establishments and uh, the services trade and business was also affected another important uh, sector that was adversely affected was construction where a large number of uh, unorganized workers were present because of uh, this the unemployment rate shot up from 7.5% before the lockdown that was uh, around uh, march middle of march or in the march month to 24% as much as 24% by may 17th you may think that okay what is the big deal you must know that 24% of uh, uh, unemployment rate was first time ever that we face in the independent india never before in the history of independent india we have had as high unemployment rate as 24% it is something which is we have never witnessed so for the first time we witness such a high unemployment rate in the country now what has happened after the uh, lockdown the distress continued it was continued basically because the economic activities could not be brought back to the pre covid level in order to find out this one yeah, there was a large survey that was conducted by an international agency and then which revealed that more than 50% of the people who were surveyed they did not want to go to restaurants because of two reasons one is that fear of contracting the virus the second important reason is that they simply did not have money to be spent on eating out the second finding from this survey is shopping trend the, the survey revealed that as many as 65% of them depended on local retailers and markets local retailers and markets means these are basically street level family owned and family operated 
shops, provision stores. So a large proportion of the uh, people were depending on that. Only 4% depended on masks that employed unorganized workers. The third thing is that the construction activity did not reach the pre-COVID level simply because of supply chain disruptions. After the lockdown was lifted, several people complained of shortages in uh, um, uh, supply of cement, steel, and so on and so forth. In uh, the state of Andhra Pradesh, even till today, they're not able to get sand, not exactly because of the supply chain disruption, but also some governance related factors. But uh, the simple fact is that the unemployment continued. Although it declined to 11% in June, in the last month it, it has declined to 11%, but it's still higher than pre-COVID level of 8%. And uh, unemployment rate in the rural areas was less, around 10%, as compared to urban areas where it is still around 12%. This is mainly attributed to favorable monsoon that you, you, you have also witnessed in uh, sitting in um, uh, Gulbarga and NREG works that were that started to pick up from June month onwards. According to International Labour Organization, because of uh, lockdown, 400 million unorganized workers face the risk of falling deeper into poverty. And then uh, the lockdown has also caused return migration, that is migration of people from the destination to the source. That means they will go back to their villages. So now we have a large number of migrants who have gone back to their villages and lockdown distress. These two factors have caused a surge in the demand for NREG work. This is what I tried to show in this graph. I do hope that you are able to see this graph. and. Uh, this graph shows the households demanding NREG work and, and then uh, the figures are shown for the last uh, uh, eight years from 2013-14 to uh, the latest uh, financial year, that means uh, the three months included, April, May, June of 2020. What it shows that the the, the number of people who demanded for NREG work remained more or less between 15 to 25 millions during the period, seven years prior to the uh, current financial year. It has never crossed beyond 30 million in any case. But look at the figures in 2020 and 21. In the month of uh, April, the number of people demanding for NREG work is less than um, 15 million, but it has gone up to 30, more than 35 millions in May and to more than 40 millions in uh, June this year. And this kind of demand we have never witnessed in the last one decade or so. This basically shows that the kind of uh, impact, adverse impact that the lockdown has had on uh, unorganized workers. So unorganized workers are really large. In India, 93% of the total workforce is in the organized sector. And uh, <clears throat> their contribution to national wealth is as much as 65%. Although they contribute uh, to the national wealth in a significant manner, they do not have access to sufficient and reliable uh, access to social security. The social security can be divided into two parts. One is protective, other one is uh, promotional. The protective uh, uh, definition is given by uh, International Labor Organization. It basically, uh, what it means that social security that is provided for the risks that are faced by individuals right from the birth to death. During this life cycle period, 
people face illness old age disability accident death unemployment and so on and so forth and social security provided to cover this life cycle risk is called protective social security we also have this uh, ilo definition was criticized by amartya sen who said that promotion social security is very important for uh, people in uh, countries like india where deprivation is the common deprivation is uh, very very commonly faced by all the people the risks are not on account of uh, life cycle uh, event but it is uh, um, it is uh, due to every day deprivation that they face so they face uh, food insecurity they face uh, health insecurity and so on and so forth so therefore you need to have promotional social security so the government have been uh, trying to provide social security to unorganized workers and this uh, has received a considerable attention and uh, especially from the year 2004 four onwards and then we have witnessed the uh, national commission being appointed reports coming out acts being made and new schemes that have come in so the importance of uh, social security has become all the more important uh, all the more uh, uh, important during and after the lockdown basically because a large proportion of the people in the country have faced the distress according to ilo countries having effective social protection systems can respond to the covid-19 crisis and its socio impact socio economic impacts better why or how exactly this, this is possible the uh, ilo explains that countries having effective uh, social security systems can quickly scale up the existing social uh, protection uh, social protection mechanisms and by extending or adapting them to reach larger proportion of the population so in view of the, this there is a need to discuss the issue of access to social security during the pandemic with this i have just completed my first section i just want to get reassured that i am uh, that everybody is uh, hearing me whether uh, are you still hearing me or uh, yes yes it, it is audible okay. audible, audible. Oh, excellent excellent now i am moving into the next section that is uh, um, social security its meaning and then types social security we have defined there was a paper that uh, we have written for uh, released along with professor geeta sen in uh, 2012 where uh, we have defined social security as measures to assist households and people facing shortages in income and basic survival needs due to work health and our family related risks and we have also stated in the same paper that social security is an important instrument for the well being of workers especially for those in the unorganized sector and their family members as well as those too young old or unable to earn an income for a variety of reasons when did uh, social security emerge and what are the types of social security systems social security emerged when industrial revolution took place in the europe in the second half of 18th century the industrial revolution brought new working conditions now a large number of workers had to come to a place called factory and they were exposed to machinery and then uh, so on and so forth so accidents became order of the day disability was uh, an important problem and then um, uh, pregnant women could not really work so the industrial revolution brought uh, new working conditions there was also some kind of impetus that was uh, Uh, there was a demand for social security schemes then trade unions uh, which were active along with the industrial revolution they demanded for what is called solidarity solidarity means that all the workers together come together and then they ask for social security and they will ensure that social security systems are uh, are established 
and they also demanded for state interference as far as the protection of workers is concerned because of uh, these efforts there were two distinct types of two distinct systems of social security which emerged in the industrialized countries the first one is called bismarckian the second one is called beveridge i will first discuss uh, about bismarckian system i am sure that most of you may have heard about bismarck as the great ruler of germany and during his period uh, the industrial uh, entities and then the policy makers they preferred employment based public schemes and these schemes were formulated to achieve income maintenance so which basically it means that workers whether they are employed or unemployed whether they are suffering from illness or they are uh, healthy when they are young or old they should have some basic minimum income so and this is something which uh, uh, will have to be provided but these benefits will have to be financed through contributions from employees and employers and sometimes also from state and these schemes were widely called as social insurance schemes they were based on insurance principles and but one important uh, point to remember is that the insurance is obligatory any worker who joins in a factory or something like that will have to compulsorily have health insurance be it health insurance or um, old age insurance or whatever it is and uh, premium is uh, was not linked to individual risk and then um, in the sense that whether somebody is healthy or sick whether, whether someone is young or old they all had to contribute some premium towards the uh, a risk that they may face at some point in time in their lifetime the principle of social insurance is grounded in spreading risks and sharing financial costs on non profit basis this principle is basically spreading of risks the next one is beveridge system in the beveridge system the emphasis is on min income protection what is called safety net in case they face some problem and then they should have some safety net and uh, <clears throat> these safety nets are provided for the entire population so therefore it is called social assistance but there is a Uh, the this system is quite different from uh, bismarckian system in the sense that social uh, assistance is primarily needs based because it's need needs based and uh, the allocation of benefits or decision to provide benefit is subject to means testing and there are several students which have uh, among the participant means testing means a household a person has to prove that he or she does not have means to support whenever there is a risk so therefore she is uh, she is seeking state assistance however means testing is not necessary if uh, social security coverage is universal and uh, unlike uh, social insurance in the bismarck system benefits in the beveridge system were provided out of specific contributions not out of uh, specific contributions but are financed through the government budget which means tax income will be the basis for providing these benefits the social assistance has become very popular and it has spread to developing countries as also and in india pensions that are given to old age people physically handicapped widows single mothers Every, all, uh, all these pensions are basically part of social uh, social assistance schemes after discussing about the types i will uh, discuss about three approaches that are uh, followed to provide social security and this discussion is important to understand uh, what exactly has happened to social security during the pandemic period and when uh, the countries were required to provide social security there were there was fierce debate on social policy 
what kind of policy is to be adopted to provide social security the first approach is welfareist this approach perceives perceives that individual is responsible for her or his poverty and this approach does not acknowledge the importance of systemic reasons for deprivation that means if somebody is sick the individual is responsible but nothing to do with the system or the system that uh, contributes to sickness of a person so because of this approach the only individual concerned is perceived to be having responsibility for protection or promotion and not the state at best some problem to some extent non state actors both profit and non profit can take up this responsibility diametrically opposite to <clears throat> the welfareist approach is that you have what what is called rights and solidarity approach this belongs to the other extreme the this approach rights approach attributes individual problem to historical and systemic systemic causes and this approach takes up a position that these causes lie beyond the power of average poor person or household so the responsibility for action social action is placed on the state with non best non state actors such as ngos playing at best a complementary role this is quite contrast to the welfareist approach in the welfareist approach the state should not really come to the rescue of the people and it can uh, the individual is responsible or non governmental organizations can take part of the burden and uh, here the poverty and deprivation are seen as characteristics of specific groups defined and subordinated by identities such as economic class caste and gender these identities derive from historical social relations of power and are reproduced by the ongoing political economy so this is uh, basically the approach of sol uh, solidarity or rights the third approach is what is called public goods instrumental rationale between somewhere between the welfareist and the rights approach you have this uh, uh, approach this approach is less concerned with classes causes and focuses more on justification for action according to proponents of this view that's public goods instrumental rationale there are two reasons why public action is necessary first reason is that the kind of benefits that such public action will have to will have on future growth so for example if you provide universal education or universal health uh, insurance or gender equality it will benefit it will be beneficial to the future growth of a country so therefore there must be some public action the second reason is that government governmentality what it means that how to politically manage dissatisfaction if workers have if workers do not have social security they will be dissatisfied and then they will uh, uh, they will uh, protest and then they will resort to strikes and other things so in order to motivate them in order to make them energetic so the public action is needed in uh, some and substance enlightened self interest is the driving force in this view for both public and private action which approach is good i would like to argue that right approach uh, is the best suited why means in both the rights as well as public goods approach there are entitlements but the character of entitlements will be different under these two approaches entitlements are programmatic um in the case of public goods but rights are more basic intrinsic inalienable and reflected in uh, constitutions or the universal declaration of human rights entitlements can be modified or even done away through programmatic changes but rights once acknowledged are difficult to be changed in this sense the linking of social protection to rights provides 
the strongest foundation for action and demands for accountability and hence addresses the long standing vulnerabilities and deprivation so as i already stated the concept of social protection should be governed by the principle of universality solidarity and efficiency given the vast size of unorganized sector in india and widespread uh, deprivation that they have i would argue that the right approach is the best suited in this presentation i take up this argument or i am advancing this argument that right approach is more useful in providing social security during the pandemic or alternatively those forms of social security which are based on rights were successful in their reach as compared to those social security measures which are not based on rights approach with this point i will move on to the next uh, section that is how many gained access to social security during the lockdown when lockdown was announced i was also sitting uh, at home like most of you and then i used to read in newspapers that a number of social security schemes are being announced by the government a thought occurred to me that how many of them will be reaching the needy people um, in uh, india because i don't have much of uh, capacity to reach others other uh, pe people in other states so we therefore thought that we can reach the people in uh, karnataka and then we can ask this question just uh, um, in the last week of uh, march itself karnataka government especially adirappa government it announced a large number of schemes um, these uh, schemes are uh, rations and cash support to women farmers and pensioners one question that occurred to me was did the rural poor receive food and cash support the food support was very very essential because they were not at all having any employment and then uh, they were they were they were not able to go out even to work or to earn income and some cash support was also in a way needed so what we thought that we should do is to collect some data from a uh, representative uh, sample uh, we had uh, uh, carried out a survey in um, 2019 from a large um, number of people and then we have randomly selected 450 households from uh, five districts and this study was done together with my colleague dr manjula and then uh, uh, what we did was we have uh, conducted telephonic survey by deploying an app um, uh, so that because see my research assistants were also spread out they were all in uh, various district tumkur some of them were in gulbarga um, uh, and so on and so forth so what we had to do was to develop this questionnaire in uh, uh, app and then we have um, uh, each of the 450 households through mobile telephone and uh, <clears throat> the sample uh, households were located in belgaum chamrajnagar dakshin kannada davanagere and gulbarga the survey was conducted in the last week of april and then uh, first half of may so we will now proceed to uh, discuss about the key findings before that i would like to mention that two types of social security were uh, provided during the lockdown the first one is food under food rice was provided rice wheat and pulse pulses in karnataka uh, some uh, distribution of milk also took place but then it was uh, we found that it was mostly confined to urban areas there was also supply of gas under ujwala scheme but that was also not uh, very prominent so but this is uh, something which is was prominent so though, therefore we are presenting the re results relating to this one but important thing is that food distribution is a rights is under rights approach because this comes under national food security act 
Whereas cash support, these all of them were schemes. The first one is the support to Jandan account holders under Prime Minister's Garib Kalyan Yojana. The second form of cash support was to farmers under Prime Minister Kisan Samman Yojana to buy inputs. The third cash support was two months of pension to pensioners at a time so that uh, um, you know they will have uh, access to some cash during the entire period of lockdown. In the next few slides, I will be presenting findings relating to access to these different schemes. First, let us look at food support. In Karnataka, soon after the lockdown, the government announced that two months of rations would be provided to BPL households in the first week of April, uh, April month in one go, so that the poor need not run around uh, to ration shops or other shops uh, in search of food. Why exactly the two months of ration means? Because the social distance was to be followed and then they were not in a, the transport was not there so that it becomes very difficult for them to travel. So the government, according to the government circular, the benefit was made available to 1.27 crore BPL cardholders, consisting of 11 lakhs of Antyodaya cardholders. Antyodaya cardholders will get 7 kg of rice per person, whereas uh, other priority card holders would get 5 kgs of rice per person. And then Antyodaya card holders would get 4 kgs of wheat, whereas other priority card holders would get 2 kgs of wheat. So this is the main difference. The estimate was that the total number of persons receiving the benefit was 5.1 crores. That means almost uh, over 80% of the total population in Karnataka. And uh, <clears throat> these rations were given at free of cost. Let us look at the evidence. The evidence is presented in this uh, chart. And uh, <clears throat> we have on x-axis the proportion of households and y-axis uh, uh, the different components of food support. This is the rice, the first bar that you see. The second one is wheat. The third one is pulses. So the, the title of the chart is that uh, food support was confined to rice, but by and large successful. Why exactly we say like this? Rice was provided to 95% of the eligible households. That means all the households that had, uh, when uh, we do look at uh, the households that had ration cards, 95% of them stated that they have received two months of ration. And this was somewhat less in the case of wheat. It was about 70%. But pulses was very low at 7%. Why exactly the pulse distribution was low? This is mainly because Karnataka government, as soon as lockdown was uh, imposed, it asked, requested the central pool to supply pulses to the state. And they were in transit at the, at the time of lockdown. And because of um, transport disruption, the pulses could not really reach uh, Karnataka. Now let us look at district-wise trends. That means, uh, do we see any major variations across the districts? You can see that the, as far as the rice distribution is concerned, all of them are around 100%. So there, is, there are no major district variations. But in the case of wheat, you find that there is some variation. Okay? There is a, a one uh, um, very noticeable thing is that in Dachshund Canada, you only about two or three percent of the eligible households received wheat. This was basically because it was decided in the district that wheat distribution will take place in the month of June, but not in April and May. This was the main reason why you see that uh, the people have not received. Otherwise, it would have been very close to 100%. The pulses were not really distributed, and it's not really because of lack of government effort, but it was due to supply bottlenecks. The other one that what we had seen is that whether the access to food support differed by caste groups, 
and then we are looking at uh, four caste groups sc st minority other backward caste and dominant caste under dominant caste we have mainly included wakaligas and lengais and reddies so these are the three caste groups that we have included and then we are looking at uh, whether the uh, access uh, differed across the groups you can see that as far as uh, rice is concerned there is no major difference as far as uh, access by different caste groups uh, is concerned so indicating that rice was distributed to all the eligible households there are no district wise variations there are no caste wise variations so which means the rice distribution was very very successful and whereas pulses distribution was hampered by supply side bottlenecks so let's move on to the uh, caste support oh, sorry before that i just want to ask this question that uh, is the distribution of rice very peculiar to karnataka or is it um, the case everywhere so we have collected uh, data for all the for all the uh, major states and this data were collected from the department of food and public distribution indian government uh, the department of uh, uh, government of india and what it shows is that the proportion of offtake of rice to allocation during the months of april to june of this year okay what it means that once allocation is made because the food distribution comes under national food security act so it is freely provided by the central government so it is in the best interest of state government to take whatever rice that is allocated as you can see that here also we have looked at uh, on uh, x axis we have uh, percentage percentage of uh, offtake to allotment and then in a several uh, states the proportion ranges between 80 to 100 percent so which means whatever is allocated was also was taken by the state government this indicates that again success and uh, <clears throat> only one state that is uh, uh, the three states it is basically zero percent it's mainly because of uh, one reason that these are all wheat eating states and they they, they don't have uh, uh, they don't really consume the rice in a large quantity that could be the reason but only in one state that is andhra pradesh it is uh, the performance is very low but i am not really able to explain why exactly the performance is low and i try to ascertain the reason but i was not given any satisfactory explanation the second uh, uh, this graph is also on uh, macro data to show that wheat distribution was confined mainly to a few states that is uh, uh, the basically the states which primarily consume wheat that's rajasthan haryana punjab delhi and gujarat in all other southern states and then uh, predominantly rice growing states the the wheat was not taken because uh, uh, because of supply disruptions now we'll let's move to cash support as i stated earlier under the cash support jandhan scheme was an important thing and then under the scheme monthly cash support of 500 rupees was provided for 3 months and then um, and then this was provided to women jandhan account holders under prime minister's garib kalyan yojana in karnataka 234.74 crores were released to 47 lakh account holders basically women account holders now let us look at how many of them have received it our survey shows that only 24.22.4% of the um, sample household confirmed that they have received the cash support through jandhan scheme and there are district wise variations in davanagere it goes up to 30% and in dakshin kannada and belga it is somewhat less but uh, uh, gulbarga is not really significantly worse off 
let's look at uh, uh, cost wise access you can see that uh, there is no discrimination against scst as far as jandan support is concerned as compared to dominant who only 20% of them uh, have uh, received and it is uh, close to uh, 30% in the case of scst but uh, one section that was uh, discriminated was minorities the proportion of uh, households stating that they have received jandan support was less than 15% these are all uh, eligible households so what we can see is that uh, jandan support was not very widespread only 22% of them have received and there are district wise variations and caste wise variations let us now look at uh, the support that was provided to farmers in karnataka uh, the total uh, support was uh, 1011 crores and it was given to 50.57 lakh farmers and then each farmer was given rupees 2000 so this was the uh, extent of support let us now look at uh, the extent to which this was accessed by the beneficiaries or uh, sample households and uh, <clears throat> cash transfer was confirmed by 40% of eligible farm farmers it's not more than that so of 100 eligible farmers only 40% have received and uh, belgaum is better at 50 more than 50% the worst of district was chamrajnagar so like in the case of jandan support the the reach of the cash support to farmers was not very widespread and there were district wise variations there are also variations across the caste groups you can see that here the support that was uh, almost close to 60% of um, eligible households from minority caste stated that they have received the support and in the case of dominant uh, caste it was uh, about 40% and uh, in the case of uh, scst it was only 30% so the trend in the case of farmers of cash support to farmers was more or less same as in the case of jandan um, uh, support and then let's move on to the last form of cash support that is pension support yes please recall that two months of pension was given in advance to elderly physically challenged destitute widows single women and transgender in one go the total number of uh, <clears throat> persons who benefited from this uh, uh, social security support was 62 lakh pensioners in the state of karnataka and they were uh, to be provided close to 1300 crores uh, during this period let's now look at how many of them have received uh, this form of cash support. the the chart here shows that only 43% of eligible pensioner households received two months of pension again there are district wise variations here kalburgi the gulbarga is the lowest and then whereas chamrajnagar is highest in um, chamrajnagar as many as 50% of the eligible stated that they have received but in the case of gulbarga it is just about 35 percent and there are also caste wise differences and then um, uh, here uh, almost close to 60 percent of the households belonging to dominant dominant caste stated that they have received uh, two months of pension in advance and this was quite low in the case of uh, minorities and then also scst so <clears throat> this is the empirical evidence that um, i have to provide and then i will conclude the presentation with uh, uh, two slides on um, conclusions and one slide on uh, uh, the way forward the first conclusion is that 
the government acted swiftly as soon as the lockdown was uh, announced it announced social security measures and then the main purpose of uh, uh, the social security measures was to provide safety nets to the poor during the period of lockdown these included both food and cash support notwithstanding government's um, uh, intention the support during the lockdown was mainly confined to rice distribution whereas the cash support was inadequate this is our conclusion number 1 the conclusion number 2 uh, two is that the distribution of food was governed by national food security act so which means it is rights based social security as a result the distribution of food was more successful as compared to cash support in addition you also will be happy to know that public distribution system is better organized in india in general and karnataka in particular in karnataka state food is distributed through 20000 more than 20000 ration shops indicating that the reach of the shops is very very good the second important characteristic of uh, distribution of food plans is that biometric identification so this uh, checks and balances will result in um, better distribution and then promotion of accountability so much so that when we talk to the people uh, during the covid uh, lockdown period most of them have appreciated the government of effort to reach rice uh, to these households but cash support could not be provided to due to supply side bot- bottlenecks these bottlenecks are the following the first bottleneck is that the government for some strange reason took the decision that the only women jandan account holders will receive the support but not male jandan account holders this is in, in contrast to some of advice provided by some of the economists for instance i distinctly remember <clears throat> professor abhijit banerjee the nobel laureate of uh, this year arguing and making a plea to the indian government that don't insist on uh, targeting and all those things try to reach as much cash support as possible to the poor people during the lockdown period but even then the government has gone for only women jandan account holders the reason why only 22% of the sample households received the support was that the rest of them most of the rest were having jandan account jandan accounts but they were all on the names of men the second reason is that the support that was given to farmers was only given if the household had kisan credit card you know that in india the prevalent uh, uh, social economic system is that only the better of people will go for this kind of credit cards and then because of this the uh, the reach is quite low so i therefore agree with the ilo's observation that is effective social protection systems are in better position to respond to the covid 19 crisis and its social economic impact so it is therefore true so therefore uh, in the conclusion two i make two important conclusions that is social security that is governed by rights or um, constitutional basis was more successful and then if the social protection system is um, uh, efficient like food distribution it uh, it reacted or it uh, it rose uh, to the occasion but not the schemes which were um, uh, haphazardly announced the final thing is the suggestions how to make social security effective i basically make five important recommendations on how, how to make social security effective in india the first one is that social security has to be universal because for some reason we have followed this policy of um, you know formulating some scheme or the other reacting to a particular thing or uh, some politician will make on some announcement so that's how a social security scheme is being announced and now some people would say that 
there are over 2,200 schemes in India in, which are in operation. And uh, they, these schemes, they do not follow the principles of right and solidarity, which means they don't have uh, the constitution as a base. These, the, the, uh, the continuation of uh, the social security schemes, they depend on whims and fancies of the government that is in the uh, place. The second important recommendation is that provide a minimum social security cover for old days and ill health. So you decide some amount. It could be 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000, whatever it is. But a minimum social security that covers uh, the old days and then ill health. And also the different social security needs of people. For example, there may be uh, young people or widows or uh, um, well, the different types of our uh, uh, physically handicapped and other things. The minimum social security should uh, cover this uh, different social security needs. The fourth important recommendation is that it's important to link um, social security with uh, social security should have a number and this should be linked to Aadhaar. This is one of the reasons why migrant households did not receive any support during the period, during the lockdown period. So if a, a social security number is given and it's linked to other migrant workers, wherever they are, they can access social security. They don't have to necessarily go back to their hometown to access the social security. The last one is that simplification of the procedures to access the social security. And in India, if a, a uh, person has to access, he has to fill in a number of uh, applications, provide support documents, class certificate, income certificate, residence certificate, and a number of certificates, and he has to run from the pillar to post. And these procedures will have to be simplified if uh, one has to uh, make social security as effective. And uh, to end my lecture, I would like to submit to all of you that if social security is based on rights and the delivery mechanism is effective, they address the needs of poor people, not only during the normal times, but also during the crisis time, such as COVID. This is where I stop. I thank you very much for your patience, listening, and then I welcome the questions from you. Over to you, Dr. Kanapati. Over to you. Yes, sir. So I have ended my uh, presentation and if there are any questions then i'll be very happy to answer dr ganapati i think i think there is some problem he left uh, the meeting he may join again uh, uh, on behalf of, I request all the participants, if you have any question or clarification, you uh, you can pose your question. I also look at the uh, chat. Uh, mm. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good, mo good morning, uh, Professor Rashid. Uh, good nice, morning. Uh, nice hearing you. This is Professor Alagodi. Hello. Uh, good morning. How are you? Oh, fine, fine. Thank you very much for your... Uh, a wonderful, insightful, and meaningful uh, uh, presentation and speech today. I'm sure okay. it has benefited all my uh, faculty, research scholars, students. Uh, okay. I think you can close your uh, presentation now because 50% uh, of the screen is uh, taken blank uh, slide. Okay, okay, okay. Let me let me see that one, and then uh, I have closed actually. Uh, let me because. Uh, uh, Huh, if you close this, then the entire screen yeah. should uh, so is it it better now? Come, out, come out of presentation mode. No, stop. Okay. Stop yeah, yeah. Now I can see you. Okay. Now I just is wanted to thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, 
sparing your valuable time i'm sure uh, our audience would have many questions for you and uh, since i was about to leave to the uh, vc's office there is a meeting i thought let me first take opportunity to thank you okay you're most welcome and then uh, nice to see you yeah same t- same here thank you we'll keep yeah, in touch yeah. again thank you sure sure certainly certainly thank you very much hello are there any uh, any other questions yes sir good morning sir good morning sir Tell my question yeah sir my question is that you talked about three approaches to the social security okay sir like welfare yeah. rights yeah solidarity yeah. public good instrumental rationale sir so yeah my question is that this social security is mostly used in our country for the informal sector yeah, yeah. Sir, sir. okay Um, what do you suggest, uh, Dr. Lingamurthy? Shall I um, take some of the yeah. questions or respond to them? Yeah, it can be. Uh, yeah. There is one more question uh, uh, texted yeah. in the chat box. Any agencies for studying social security in India? Any? Any agencies for study? Any agencies for studying social security in India? Okay. Sure. 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 Okay. That is from and, uh, Roshan Jo. Uh, uh, the second is that. Uh, uh, what What is the name of the second person? Roshan Jo. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. So first, uh, uh, responding to Ravi Kumar's uh, question, it's a very in, uh, interesting question. <clears throat> of the three approaches that uh, we follow in India. the rights approach was never there uh, about 20 years ago it started with uh, uh, narega so from uh, national rural employment guarantee scheme onwards we have now uh, some of them uh, uh, for uh, uh, employment we have uh, it's a rights based for education it's a rights based again uh, this is national uh, uh, education act has come in and then for uh, food again national food security act uh, this uh, these are the three social security measures that are governed by rights but all others are mainly governed by schemes so it is a um uh, it they are not rights based and then one can say that uh, they are basically public uh, the basically instrumental uh, public goods instrumental approach that means they are not really based on the rights approach so one can say that uh, say some 30 to 40% of the social security schemes are governed by right, rights but the rest of them are not governed by see as far as the other question is concerned the agencies for studying uh, social security uh, unfortunately we don't have any centralized agencies and then the responsibility is taken up by some of the um, organ some of the universities and research institutes there is one social security association of india the social security association of india which is which has got headquarters in uh, delhi and it has several uh, chapters in different states they undertake some studies but then they are not really systematic and then also the other important i think what they do is that they mainly take up uh, studies relating to the uh, formal uh, social security mechanism not not for informal sector workers the provident fund or gratuity and some of these uh, things that they examine okay. are you happy with uh, this response roshan yes, sir. yeah yes sir so any other question now i can see the pushpa and uh, she is not able to hear i suppose no ma- madam is there sir madam is there. she is listening to you yeah in between uh, there was some uh, problem with my speech i mean hearing now i am able to hear yeah it was very good very interesting professor so oh, thank you very much yeah very and, informative uh, yeah any other question Thank you, Rohan, uh, for Rohan for your comment. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, sir. 
if if uh, anyone you don't have any questions so we can conclude here sir can i ask okay. there is one question yeah sure bibin please go ahead ask okay uh, sir recently i read in uh, the hindustan time article that uh, the universal basic income is not good and like they proposed like uh, some professor called karthik madhavan like proposed inclusive gro uh, growth dividend so what's your take on that yeah. uh, so thing is that uh, so your question is that uh, basic income is not really good but then uh, uh, what is called uh, dividend inclusive growth dividend inclusive growth dividend yeah i see thing is that uh, <clears throat> the main difference between uh, universal basic income and inclusive growth dividend is that uh universal basic income will be provided whether the uh, economy is performing or not performing whether it's inclusive or not inclusive okay so it is a commitment that that is made by the government to provide basic income to all the uh, deserving uh, the basically the needy people there will be some means testing uh, but it will be given to everyone whereas inclusive uh, uh, growth dividend is that it is a basically on the basis of certain attributes of development or attributes of the growth if a growth is faster if growth is inclusive then only you provide the dividend but not really um, uh, this thing so the main difference is that in a uni universal basic income there are no checks and balances and whereas in the universal uh, sorry in the inclusive growth dividend there will be some checks and balances but i think uh, uh, for a country like uh, india which has got uh, 90% of uh, um 90% of the workers are in the unorganized sector universal basic income is a better option as compared to any other um, you know uh, some uh, conditional kind of support so any other question Um, sir one one the, one student raji raji woman has uh, texted a mess, uh, question he is asking yeah. uh, okay. how the government took decision about taxation how the government uh, uh, took the decision took on taxation decision, uh, decision about taxation sir in the sense that uh, i am not able to um, quite understand Okay. yeah i don't know uh, i am also in which context he is asking <laughs> yeah yeah i i did yeah yeah mohammed khan motion khan Mohd, yes, sir. yeah please provide a little more explanation on why the migrant laborers failed to receive immediate help from the state as well as central government and cause a temporary humanitarian crisis yes this is again very important uh, good question uh, uh, mohsin see the base, main reason is that uh, the lockdown was announced by giving four hour notice so and it was basically stated that uh, they were given two types of uh, assurance number one the lockdown will be only for 21 days number two there will be some support that will be provided yeah and uh, uh, both the, on both counts they were let down first of all the lockdown extended uh, well beyond 21 day period that's number one number two the the support that was promised to them was not provided because of because of one of the reasons that i mentioned see the important uh, problem with our social security system is that it does not have social security number okay unlike other countries so for example in usa there is a social security number for instance south korea which uh, uh, we are now regularly visiting and then conducting some studies there and there is a social security which was given in a social security number which was given in uh, 1960s and because of the social security number they are able to reach the needy people um, um, immediately so because of lack of uh, social security number 
they were the government was not able to reach the migrant laborers immediately and then that's what caused the humanitarian crisis crisis so these are the two reasons why uh, that kind of uh, temporary humanitarian crisis was caused are you happy with this uh, response uh, mr mohsin yeah thank you you are welcome any other question yeah i have sir ingamurthy here yeah 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 uh, uh, thank you for your wonderful and field based evidences uh, presentation sir uh, uh, it is very enlightenment to uh, all the participants particularly for me also because uh, i did not uh, go through the field level study and this is the first presentation uh, which is uh, presented based on the field field based study uh, thank you for that uh, 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 you mentioned rights based approach is the only solution to uh, get uh, give the benefits to the needy people so on the basis of rights based uh, uh, solution uh, there is a scheme mgnra right you pointed out so if you look at the mgnra also uh, uh, government has to provide 100 days of work within 15 days of application so it's their demand they can demand uh, the work with uh, and when the demand uh, uh, orally are written so they have to provide the, a job for 15, uh, within 15 days if they want provide they have to give some kind of uh handorium for not giving the employment even though if you look at mgnrg employment status still now it is less than 60% in all states so this is one problem and second problem uh, uh when the government missionary or gram panchayat is not going to uh, provide uh employment within 15 days there are few people uh, who can uh, utilizing our are uh, catching this kind of uh, act to uh, uh, violate uh, uh, the officials uh, integrity or uh, they are getting some kind of uh, uh, earnings out of it uh, through rights based activism so i would like to bring it to you because i worked in nid for 2 years and i was working in NIR and mg energy for uh, particularly studying throughout the country and i observed uh, from all gram panchayats and all block offices even collectors also said something so that i would like to bring to you and i would like to learn, uh, hear from you sir thank you yeah certainly this is a very important point <clears throat> see it is that uh, rights based uh, approach to social security is uh, is desirable from one view point that is what happens is that the this entitlements which are linked to rights cannot be taken away by any government so they will have to remain so that's one of the important reasons and uh, <clears throat> see what has happened i have shown you a chart the about 40 more than 40 million people have demanded for um, narega this year okay this uh, january the june month the last month the total number of people demanding for narega employment was as many as 40 millions this was never uh, before in the in the recent past that means in the last 8 uh, years or so this is the this is the first time that number has really gone up to this level so what it shows that if uh, uh, social security is entitlement uh, so rights based that will remain and then it can uh, it can uh, become important whenever it is needed that's number one number two uh, there are now a number of studies which have come out and then uh, not indian studies but then uh, all over the world the studies are being ca carried out in us universities even in the london school of economics and then uh, oxford university in several places there have been impact studies on uh, narega what has exactly happened after narega was introduced the all the studies show that in india after the introduction of uh, narega three things have happened three things i would like to tell you one is that there is a um, increase substantial increase in uh, real agricultural wages even uh, we have also worked on this and then we have published a paper in uh, in the world development but not only our paper there are also three two three other papers which have come in which show that the real agricultural uh, wages have gone up by 4.3% if we add the 6% uh, of inflation which means after the introduction of narega 
the wages have gone up by 10%. How did this happen? This basically happened because the Narega, it may be very ineffective, only 60%, uh, uh, only 60 days of employment may have been given and all those things, but it, it has resulted in some kind of contraction of, uh, uh, you know, the, basically the creation of demand for laborers in rural areas. That is one of the reasons why the real agricultural wages have gone up. The second uh, important finding from studies, from these different studies is that the people below poverty line has declined. And then this is based on macro level data. That means incidence of poverty after the introduction of Narega has come down. So this is the imp second important thing. The third important um, um, factor is that the Narega has benefited women laborers, much women and elderly laborers much more than men. Okay. So, and then uh, the fourth one also I should tell you that there have been some interesting studies which have been undertaken, uh, uh, especially in the Maoist uh, regions actually. And then after the introduction of uh, Narega, the Maoist violence has come down. So this is, there are also studies which show that the number of cases that were there before uh, Narega and after Narega. So there are studies which show that uh, the uh, Narega being uh, linked to rights uh, has had a considerable impact. But at the same time, your point is also correct. That is, if you look at uh, the number of days of employment that has been provided, if you look at uh, the uh, number of uh, households receiving 100 days of employment, and if you look at uh, the, um, the quality of works, if you look at the extent of um, uh, this uh, use of machinery in the implementation of uh, Narega works, all these point to a basic problem with the Narega problem, that is implementation is a problematic. Implementation is a really issue. Because when I was telling you about food distribution, food distribution, I was making two points. One is that rice distribution is governed by the Act, that is National Food Security Act, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, the distribution in um, all over India is quite good. Now, there are these outlets everywhere. Even, uh, primary, the bags are also um, uh, included as a distribution point, and there is a biometric uh, test that is being done now. Okay, So only the... Um, the beneficiary household will have to go there and then give a thumb impression and only those people will be given rice. Okay? So therefore, it is two. One is that social security has to be linked to rights. At the same time, there, the mechanism should also be very, very effective. In the case of Narega, what was happening was the me delivery mechanisms have not really become effective. That was the main uh, an important point. I do hope that uh, I have provided some explanation to you. Are you satisfied or uh, still uh, um, any problem, Dr. Lindamurthy? Uh, yes, sir. I will discuss later, sir, because okay. uh, there may be some more questions from the participants. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, no problem. Sir. Hello, sir. Sir, I have one more question, sir. Okay, Ravi Kumar, tell me, please. The lockdown happened this time only, sir. But okay. our internal informal sector workers are deprived from social security since the beginning or independence. Sir, why our government is not able to establish a robust mechanism for their social security? Because if it is possible for the formal sector worker, why not for them? Thank okay. You, See, if, uh, <clears throat> I think that's a good question. I think uh, we have failed to provide social security to a large proportion of uh, Unorganized workers in the past, basically because we believed in what is called schemes. Okay, so uh, unorganized workers have got problem, health problem. You introduce some health insurance, and then uh, even within the health insurance, there are three types of uh, health uh, uh, protection that needs to be provided: primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. Primary care means it's basically whenever uh, somebody gets, uh, you know, some kind of fever or cough or cold, and then you go to a doctor and then doctor uh, checks you and then gives you some uh, medicines. 
no hospitalization is necessary okay so this is what is called primary health care secondary health care is that uh, involves those illnesses which uh, which result in hospitalization for a day such as you know appendicitis uh, operation so you need to be hospitalized or uh, cataract operation or some of the uh, the delivery delivery requires some three days of uh, hospitalization so this is what is called secondary health care the traditional health care is that uh, where uh, you know prolonged operation is needed a uh, problem relating to kidneys or uh, cancer heart problems and so on so forth so we have three types of um, yeah. for each of the health care there is one scheme at one point in time we had uh, in karnataka uh, there was uh, arogyasri which was uh, um, meant for uh, ter uh, tertiary care there was rsby which was meant for secondary care and there was also yashashwini which was only for Uh, the farmers or uh, those who are members of um, uh, you know uh, cooperative societies so there is a, some kind of uh, uh, fragmentation that takes place that means the government is not looking social security as a in a holistic sense that is a family it faces risks on account of food health education sickness old age or uh, disability or whatever it is and then death of uh, principal earning member so they should be provided social security in a comprehensive sense i think this is something which is not really uh, appreciated or accepted by the government so the what happens is that social security tends to be piecemeal okay piecemeal and different uh, departments will be will be you know implementing one scheme or two schemes or something else. so there is a fragmentation not only in, in terms of number of schemes but also fragmentation in terms of who implements so because of this fragmentation and then not looking at uh, uh, social security in holistic manner that is the reason we have a problem so that therefore i advocated this universalization suppose you have to universalize that means anyone who is having some uh, problem they will be provided the social security regardless of whether they have problem they don't have problem whether they bpl or they not bpl whether they live in urban areas or rural areas the social security has to be provided as a matter of entitlement and security so this is the main reason why it was uh, not successful in the past any other uh, uh, thank you thank you sir yes. thank you so much sir yeah you're welcome hello yeah uh, dr ganpati i am hearing you yes sir uh, uh, is any participant want still want to ask any questions otherwise we can conclude the session thank you very much thank you for uh, listening to me and then uh, uh, so, uh, so, once again <laughs> thanks to um, professor pushpa saudati for giving this opportunity to share my some of my views with you thank you very much so please you, hold on uh, thank yeah, you go ahead sir. yeah thank you professor for a wonderful lecture field based evidence based this is the first in our series that we had uh, on evidence based it was very interesting and uh, very informative and enlightening for our students and faculty thank you very much professor yeah your most yeah. welcome uh, Uh, sir as a uh, um, uh, part of this uh, formal vote of thanks so i thank you for your uh, wonderful insightful and informative lecture sir uh, when i was listening to you i i felt that politicians should have attended this program and, and the bureaucrats who are the in the helm of decision making should have attended this kind of workshop uh, and then then they would have taken better decisions sir that's was my feeling so and all the students those going to be the future administrators or politicians so they will get benefited from your lecture so i thank you for uh, your wonderful lecture sir on behalf of uh, department of uh, economic studies and planning central university of karnataka and my behalf and i also thank professor pushpa saudati madam lingmurthy sir and basura sir for giving me opportunity to moderate this session
and once again thank you one and all for your uh, attendance and uh, listening for the sir's lecture thank you one and all thank you very much and then i just wanted to congratulate uh, professor pushpa saudati for uh, taking this initiative it's very good initiative and please keep it up that is a team of